A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be doing a review for exam one for Biology 1408. This exam covers lecture handouts from chapter one, two, and three. So let's go ahead and get started with chapter one, biology, the study of life. Now, the things I really, really need you to know are these concepts of the scientific method. And I, what I really want you to know, remember, science begins with observations. Science begins with an observation. And then do you recall the steps of the scientific method? Observation, background research, formulate a question, hypothesis, prediction, experimentation, conclusions, and communicating results. So this is important to understand. I really want you to understand the concept of a hypothesis. Please know about what makes a good hypothesis. Remember, a hypothesis does not have a question mark at the end. Remember that a, a good hypothesis is both testable and falsifiable. Remember that? So we want to know that. We want to know that a hypothesis is a suggested explanation for your event. It is testable. It is falsifiable. It does not have a question mark at the end. So if I were to give you some examples of hypotheses, you should be able to tell me what's the correct uh, correctly phrased hypothesis, which one is the best hypothesis. Also with experiments, we learned about experiments. They're there to test the hypothesis. What is a variable? What is a control? What's the difference between qualitative data and quantitative data? What is the difference? So we want to know the difference between qualitative data and quantitative data. What does it mean, I want you to know, what does it mean to falsify a hypothesis? What does it mean to fail to falsify a hypothesis? Which one shows that your hypothesis was true? I want you to think about that. Which one means your hypothesis was true? If you failed to falsify the hypothesis or if you falsified the hypothesis? And remember, you, if you fail to falsify the hypothesis, that means the hypothesis was true. So that's something definitely to know about. Falsify, falsify the hypothesis. Very good. Remember, I want you to know this, that scientists don't throw around the word proved very often. You, uh, science does not prove. Instead, science shows evidence for, right? So prove is not a word that scientists use. What else? Um, one more thing I want you to know that theory, I want you to know this, that a theory, a theory is not just some guess or hunch. To a scientist, a theory is a tested and confirmed explanation, okay? So it's not just a guess, okay? Those things are very important to know about science. Next, let's touch on what is life all about. So next, we're going to touch on that. But first, let's take a quick little break. All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's carry on with our discussion of life. What is life? Remember that life defies a simple definition. But what you should know is that these here are the characteristics of life. Let me get my screen back to full size, display mode. See, um, what you should know is that these are the characteristics of life. So if I were to give you a list, for example, which of the following is not a characteristic of life, you should know that it would be the odd man out. It would be the one not listed here. So characteristics of life. We need to know about the characteristics of life. Also, remember this hierarchy? 
of biological organization, you need to know a couple of things here. You need to know that cells are, uh, the l life begins at the, at the level of a cell. So cell, the cell is the basic unit of life. We need to know that the cell is the basic unit of life. What does that mean? It means if you're simpler than a cell, you're not typically considered life. Also, what I really want you to know for the exam is the difference between a population, a community, an ecosystem, and the biosphere. So please know the definitions for those. So the difference between a population and community, for example, and, and the difference between those and an ecosystem. So please know those terms. What else do I want you to know? Oh yeah, remember binomial nomenclature? For example, our two word epithet, homo sapiens. I want you to know how you're supposed to uh, depict binomial nomenclature. So what do I mean by that? Remember that the first word is the genus and it is capitalized. The second word is the species and it's lowercase. I need you to know that. And then also, do you remember that you need to italicize the whole thing or underline the whole thing? If you don't have all of those uh, items in place, if you haven't capitalized the genus, lowercase species, and italicized or underlined, then it is incorrect. So I need you to know binomial, proper binomial nomenclature. And then we talked about the difference between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. I need you to know that only eukaryotic cells, eukaryotes have membrane bound organelles. Remember that? And what's the main membrane bound organelle that I needed you to know about? The nucleus. Remember the nucleus? It's the main membrane bound organelle of eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, Eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells have none of those. Then I needed you to know the three domains of life. The three domains of life. Do you remember the three domains of life? Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The three domains of life. And by the way, remember that bacteria are prokaryotic cells. Archaea consist of prokaryotic cells, and it is only the eukarya that consist of eukaryotic cells, right? What else? The eukarya include plants, fungi, animals, and protists. And lastly, I wanted you to know about taxonomy. Do you remember the taxonomical hierarchy? So I need you to know that a species like Ursus americanus, the black bear, right? A species is a population. The species are the individuals of a species can interbreed and have fertile offspring, right? And then there's the genus. The genus includes other closely, mem uh, closely related members. And then there's family. And then there's order. And then there's class. And then there's phylum. These are these are is a hierarchy of increasing breadth all the way to domain. So what I want you to know is I want you to know this in order. I want you to know from species to domain in order or from domain to species in order. And I have a helpful trick for you to remember this right here on this link. So please know the taxonomical hierarchy from domain. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species in order. Uh, you don't need to, obviously, you don't need to memorize any of this stuff down here. This is all specific to the black bear. Okay, so that's it. That's it for this chapter that I want you to know. So please know those, and I've made a nice little list here myself of things that I wanted you to know. Please learn those concepts really well for the, for the exam, and you'll be set. You'll be just fine. All right? So let's move on to chapter two, and I'll give you some tips and tricks on what to focus on there. All right, everyone, let's start with chapter two now. Chapter two covers chemistry. Please know these terms in bold, but let's see what we really want to focus in on. We want to know about atoms. Do you remember how atoms have protons and neutrons? 
at the atomic nucleus in the center, but the electrons, the electrons exist in orbitals. The electrons are outside in orbitals. Let's see here. We should know about these chemical symbols. Do you remember the chemical symbols? Uh, chemical symbols. Let's know about the chemical symbols. Do you know what the six stands for? Uh, for example, carbon six. The six is called the atomic number. And that was the number of protons. So we should know that the the six here stands for the atomic number, and that means how many protons does carbon have? And then we should know another part of the chemical symbol. We should know this part here. Do you remember the 12? The 12 stands for the mass number, the mass number, and that means the number of protons, six, plus the number of neutrons. So in this case, it would be six. So the, so when I see 12 here, it means six protons plus six neutrons. Does that make sense? So this carbon, because this is an isotope of carbon, that means that it has a different number of neutrons. In this case, this carbon has seven neutrons with six protons. That's why the mass number is 13. This uh, isotope of carbon is called carbon-12 because it has six protons and six neutrons. So know what an isotope is as well. Isotopes are the same chemical, uh, the same element like carbon, but different numbers of neutrons. You should also know that atoms are neutral. Atoms are neutral. What does that mean? They have the same number of protons as electrons. What else do we want to know? Let's learn about chemical bonds, right? Chemical bonds. You should know about covalent bonds. What is a covalent bond? Remember, a covalent bond means sharing of a pair of electrons. This is where electrons are shared. Remember that? We're sharing electrons and that's giving you a bond. And you remember there could be single covalent bonds, double covalent bonds, triple covalent bonds. And these are strong. Covalent bonds are strong. They involve sharing of electrons. Next, let's talk about ionic bonds. Ionic bonds. Uh, these are uh, where electrons are not being shared. Remember, electrons are not being shared. In this case, what you have is uh, uh, sodium, for example, loses an electron and chlorine gains an electron. So ionic bonds are between oppositely charged, oppositely charged uh, ions. Okay, so what you should know is this. An ionic bond is an attraction between an anion and a cation. That means a negative charge and a positive charge. So you have a negative and a positive ion stuck together. That's an ionic bond. So you, what you need to know is that there is no sharing that of an electron in an ionic bond. It is the attraction between oppositely charged ions. And do you remember what ions are? These are charged versions of elements. So negative charged uh, element or a positively charged element. Electronegativity. Do you remember how electronegativity increases as you look left and as you go up on the periodic table? So the periodic table of elements, these elements are the most electronegative. And do you remember that when there is sharing between uh, a less electronegative atom like uh, hydrogen and a more electronegative atom like oxygen, then you could it, this could result in what's known as a polar covalent bond. This means that there is uneven sharing of electrons. The electrons move towards the more electronegative 
atom. So in this case, oxygen would be more electronegative than hydrogen. Oxygen would have the partial negative charge. Hydrogen would have the more partial positive charge. So you see here, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Look here, oxygen is to the right of hydrogen. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So it pulls the electrons closer to it. This results in oxygen having a partial negative charge and, a, and the hydrogens having a partial positive charge. So the reason I highlighted this for you is because it's so important. It explains why water is polar. You've heard that water is polar, right? So why is water polar? Water is polar because there is covalent bonds between the oxygen and those two hydrogens. So there's a sharing of the electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogens. But because oxygen is more electronegative, oxygen is more greedy for those electrons, the electrons spend more time with the oxygen than the hydrogens. And that results in what? That results in a partial negative charge on the oxygen and a partial positive charge on each hydrogen, okay? So please understand this. In fact, I'm gonna write that down. Um, be able to understand why water is polar. Why is water polar? And like I said, it's polar because of this highlighted region here. Water is polar because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Okay, um, and who has the partial negative charge in water? Oxygen has the partial negative charge and hydrogen has the partial positive charges. So let's note that. That's very important. And actually for lab one as well, you know your lab covering water and the properties of water, it's gonna be very important for that lab. So what are hydrogen bonds? You should know hydrogen bonds are a weak type of bond. Hydrogen bonds. You see, hydrogen bonds are denoted by little dots. Hydrogen bonds are weak bonds between a partial negative end on one, uh, uh, one polar molecule and the partial negative end uh, on the other. So here you got a partial positive hydrogen from water. It will have a weak uh, attraction for the partial negative end on this ammonia. And there's this weak attraction between the water and the ammonia because of these partial charges. And that's called a hydrogen bond. So what do I need you to know? Hydrogen bonds are weak. We need to know that they're weak. And we need to know that they are between partial positive and partial negative. So um, they are a weak attraction between polar molecules um, of opposite partial charge. All right, before we go in too much more about water, let's take a little quick break time and we'll continue and finish off chapter two with the important things to know about chapter two as well for the exam. <laughs> All right, let's continue on with our discussion of water. What you need to know about water is that individual water molecules can stick to one another. This is called cohesion. Remember this term, where is it at? Cohesion. Water molecules stick to one another with cohesion. And what's the force that holds them together with cohesion? Those are hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds hold water molecules together. This phenomenon is known as cohesion. So please know cohesion is water molecules sticking to one another with hydrogen bonds. Also, this is really important. Do you remember that water is less dense? Water is less dense when frozen than it is when it's liquid. So this is why ice floats, right? Ice floats because water is less dense when it freezes into ice. Water is a good solvent. Water is a good solvent. Remember, water can dissolve polar molecules and water can dissolve ions. 
water dissolves things. What can water not dissolve? See at the bottom? Water cannot dissolve nonpolar or uncharged solutes. So water cannot dissolve uncharged or nonpolar solutes. Do you remember adhesion? We should know the term adhesion. It's a little different than cohesion, right? Remember, adhesion is water sticking to other polar molecules. Cohesion was water sticking to itself. So the, know the difference between adhesion, water sticking to other polar molecules, and cohesion, water sticking to itself. All right. Uh, with regard to pH, you don't have to worry about pH so much for 1408. Now we talked about um, carbon a little bit. What do we need to know about carbon? What do I want you to know about carbon? I want you to know just the concept of isomers. I want you to know what an isomer is. Do you remember isomers? Isomers are molecules that have the same chemical formula, so they're made up of the same components, but they have a different structure. So you see, for example, butane here. You see butane here? This is C4H10. And do you see isobutane here? This is also C4H10, but you see how they're different? That's what an isomer is. Same molecule, uh, same molecular composition, different arrangement, right? So please know what an isomer is. What else do we need to know? Do you remember the functional groups? Here's what I need you to know about the functional groups, okay? For 1408, this is what we need to know. Hydroxyl groups, this is a hydroxyl group. We need to know that a hydroxyl group makes a molecule an alcohol. OH makes a molecule an alcohol. Any molecule with an OH is an alcohol. What do we need to know about a carbonyl group? We need to know that when you have a double bond O, double bond O, this is a carbonyl group. Double bond O is a carbonyl group. Do you remember this functional group? This is a carboxyl group, carboxyl. What do I want you to know about the carboxyl group? So when you hear carboxyl group, remember that carboxyl groups make a molecule an acid. I need you to know that carboxyl functional groups, if a molecule has a carboxyl functional group like this, that makes the whole molecule an acid. What about an amino functional group? What, what happens if a molecule, like glycine, what happens if a molecule has an amino functional group? I need you to know that an amino group makes a molecule a base. It's a basic functional group. A sulfhydro, sulfhydro groups are special because they can cross-link. They can form disulfide bonds. So know that sulfhydro functional groups can form disulfide bonds. Phosphate groups have a negative charge. Phosphate groups have a negative charge. That's what we need to remember about phosphate groups. Please remember that phosphate groups have a negative charge. Methyl groups have no charge. That's what we need to remember about the methyl group. So you see this CH3, this methyl group? Methyl groups have no charge, so they're nonpolar. Please remember those things. And that is really it for chapter two. I made it, I made notes here of all the things I wanted you to remember. So please touch on those things. Please learn those concepts that I just mentioned in as much detail as you can for the exam. Let's move on to the final chapter for the first exam, uh, uh, chapter three, and we'll do that right next. All right, let's get started with chapter three here. What I need you to know in chapter three is the difference between biomolecules and macromolecules. Do you recall that the biomolecules we talked about were the carbohydrates, lipids,
proteins, and nucleic acids. However, only three out of these four are macromolecules. Lipids are not considered macromolecules. So the macromolecules are what? The macromolecules are carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. Why? Because macromolecules are composed of monomers that link together to form polymers. Lipids do not link together. So lipids, see, oh sorry, what it says at the bottom, lipids are not macromolecules. So definitely know which of the biomolecules is not a macro, and that's lipids. Next, how do we form polymers? How do it, when we're talking about macromolecules, how do we link monomers together to form polymers? And do you remember that's called dehydration reaction? Remember that? So you need to know that dehydration reaction results in monomers linking together to form polymers. And how do we break those polymers back down into monomers? That was hydrolysis. Hydrolysis breaks down macromolecules. Dehydration reaction builds macromolecules. Next, we talked about sugars. Remember the carbohydrates? I need you to know this about the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So, again, carbohydrates are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So there's one carbon for every two hydrogens for every one oxygen. What is the bond called when you link sugars together when you do dehydration reaction and link sugars together. So when you link sugars together, I need you to know this. When you link sugars together, the bond that forms between the two sugars is called a glycosidic linkage or a glycosidic bond. So please know that term, glycosidic bond. That's the bond that forms between sugars when you link them together. What else do we need to know? I'm trying to figure out what else I would like you to know about sugars. Those are some of the main things. So what I want you to know also is that starch is a polysaccharide made of glucose. I need you to know that cellulose is a polysaccharide made of glucose as well. However, starch is made for storage of energy, whereas cellulose is made for, for structural reasons, for structure of the cell. Let's, let's skip over to lipids. That's about all I want you to know about carbs. Let's go to lipids. What do I need you to know about lipids? Lipids tend to be nonpolar. I want you to know that lipids tend to be nonpolar because they're made up of all kinds of carbons and hydrogens. I want you to know about fat. This is a fat molecule. I want you to know this. I want you to know that a fat is comprised of a glycerol, a glycerol head, glycerol, plus three of these tails. Remember, these are called fatty acid tails. So that's what I want you to know. There are three fatty acid tails and a glycerol head. So this is a fat. You see, this molecule is a fat. There is the glycerol head, and here are the three fatty acid tails. So please know that a fat is comprised of a glycerol and three fatty acid tails. And it, the difference between a saturated fat and a non-saturated fat is the presence of double bonds in the fatty acid tails. So did you see that? Double bonds, double bonds in the fatty acid tails makes a 
unsaturated fat. So do you remember this? There's a difference between saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Saturated fats have no double bonds in the fatty acid tails. Unsaturated fats have the presence of double bonds in the, sat in the uh, fatty acid tails. What else do I want you to know about the difference between saturated fats and unsaturated fats? Saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature. Solid at room temperature like butter. Unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature, such as vegetable oil or olive oil. Okay, so difference, I want you to know the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats. Another one is saturated fats tend to come from animals, animal products. Unsaturated fats tend to come from plants. Okay, animal First plant. Okay, great. Those are the things to know. Phospholipids, what do I want you to know about phospholipids? They are very similar to fats in that they have a glycerol, two fatty acid tails, and a phosphate group. Let's know the structure of, of phospholipid. Phosphate group, glycerol, and two fatty acid tails. So I want you to know that a phospholipid has a glycerol, two fatty acid tails, and a phosphate group. That's about what I want you to know about phospholipids. And what about steroids? We should know that steroids, steroids have four rings. You see, when you see a molecule that has four fused rings like this, it's a steroid. Steroids are a type of lipid, and they have four fused rings. That's what I want you to know about steroids. They're a type of lipid and they have four fused rings. So before we dump, uh, in, jump into uh, proteins, let's take a little break again. All right, everyone, let's carry on with our review with proteins. What do I need you to know about proteins? Proteins are made up of amino acids. I need you to know that. Proteins are made of amino acids. And I need you to know that an amino acid includes a amino group, a carboxyl group, an alpha carbon, and a side chain. So those are the four parts of an amino acid. Amino acid structure. We should know that, those four parts. All right. What's a polypeptide? Remember, that's a protein. Amino acids link together to form polypeptides. And what are the bonds called between amino acids? Remember when we do dehydration reaction and we link amino acids together? I want you to know what kind of bond is formed. That's called a peptide bond. We need to know. We need to know peptide bonds. So when you link amino acids together, the bond that forms is called a peptide bond. I really need you to know that. Very good. I want you to know that proteins need to fold in order to function. Prote proteins need to fold correctly. I also want you to know that if a protein gets uh, unfolded, you know what that's called? Denaturation. If a protein is denatured, the protein unfolds and it no longer functions. So a, a protein needs to fold correctly. If a protein unfolds, that's called what? It's called denatured or denaturation. And that's not good. Once a protein denatures, once a protein unfolds, it loses its function. And what can cause a protein to unfold or denature? That's right, things like pH, temperature, ionic concentration of solution, so environmental conditions. These are the important things I want you to know about proteins, okay? Next, this is the final concept, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. What do I need you to know? Here, I need you to know this.
I need you to know the three components of nucleotides. A nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, right? A phosphate group, um, a nitrogenous base, right? And a pentose sugar, a five carbon sugar. That's what pentose sugar means, pentose sugar. Okay, great. So that's a nucleotide. Nucleotides make up DNA. Nucleotides make up RNA. Great. Now, do you remember what's the pentose sugar of DNA? Let me show you. In DNA, the pentose sugar is called deoxyribose. So I want you to, to know that the, the sugar in DNA is called deoxyribose deoxyribose. The sugar in RNA is called ribose. The pentose sugar of RNA is ribose. The pentose sugar of DNA is deoxyribose. So that's the part that goes here. What about the nitrogenous bases? What do I want you to know about those? Those are those A's, G's, C's, and T's. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, right? Do you remember the nitrogenous bases? So DNA, you should know that DNA uses which nitrogenous bases? DNA uses adenine, it uses guanine, cytosine, and thymine, right? These are the nitrogenous bases for DNA. And what's the difference between DNA and RNA? Well, in RNA, RNA uses uracil, U, instead of thymine, T. I want you to know that. RNA uses uracils instead of thymines. Okay? So DNA uses A's, G's, C's, and T's. Whereas RNA uses A's, G's, C's, and U's. I need you to know that. <clears throat> and then do you see what we have here in the bottom left? Complementary base pairing. A's pair with T's in DNA. A's pair with T's. You should know that A complements with T in DNA. With how many hydrogen bonds? Two hydrogen bonds. What about in RNA? In RNA, A pairs with U with two hydrogen bonds. A pairs with U with two hydrogen bonds. And in both DNA and RNA, G's pair with C's with three hydrogen bonds. G's pair with C's with three hydrogen bonds. Great. Awesome. So you see when you have two strands of DNA, you have double-stranded DNA, A's pair with T's with two hydrogen bonds. C's pair with G's with three hydrogen bonds. You see that? It's really interesting stuff. Great. Those are the things I really need you to know. I've made a list of those as well. So I'll make sure to include those on the exam. I hope this helped you. Remember, there are videos to watch as well for more details, but please focus on those concepts I just touched on in this video for the exam. Exam one will cover chapters one, two, and three. I know you can do it. Study hard, and uh, I wish you good luck on the exam. Thanks. Bye. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D.